Welcome Dr. Leon Schurgers to the A4M main stage today. Dr. Schurgers is Professor of Biochemistry of Vascular Calcification and Vice Chair of the Department of Biochemistry, which is part of the Cardiovascular Research Institute, Maastricht University. He is also Chair of the Stem Cell Research at the University. Dr. Schurgers is currently working on vitamin K research. His research work includes molecular biology, biochemistry, animal and human nutrition, pharmacology, and clinical studies in the fields of atherosclerosis and osteoporosis. His project line aims to elucidate the role of vascular smooth muscle cells in vascular remodeling and calcification, and how this is initiated and propagated. Key cellular events of small muscle cells include phenotypic switching, oxidative stress, inflammation, and formation of extracellular vesicles. The regulation of vitamin K-dependent protein biosynthesis, its sites of action, and its putative relationship with remodeling and calcification is insufficient to understand the pathogenesis of vascular aging at a level that allows the development of novel diagnostic tools and therapeutic strategies. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Schurgers. So today I want to discuss with you some data on inflammation, calcification, and cardiovascular disease, which is still the biggest killer in the world. I also want to connect that to vitamin K research. And yesterday we heard a fantastic presentation by Dr. Rifai, who said that inflammation is the fire and that calcification is the smoke. And that I want to see it from a different perspective. And I hope that I can convince you that maybe the smoke is inflammation, which we measure in the circulation, but that within the vessel wall, it's the calcification that is the fire. These are my disclosures. None of them are personal grants, but all uh, to the Institute. And these are the learning goals. Now, if we go to cardiovascular disease, it's still the leading cause of death. And here we see the picture from the World Health Organization. It beats cancer death by twofold. And even in the time of COVID-19, which we are still remembering, um, happy that that is more or less over and that we are able to travel again, also cardiovascular disease is way bigger in number of deaths in any other disease. And even if you compare it, let me, then one third of all deaths globally is caused by cardiovascular disease. So we really need to find a solution to reduce this burden on cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality. Now, we all are familiar with the risk factors. We have high cholesterol, we have high blood pressure, unhealthy diet, obesity, lack of exercise, we have uh, smoking, but also comorbidities like diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Now, diving a little bit deeper into cardiovascular disease, this happens at certain spots in your body. We do have cardiovascular disease in the heart, where the coronary arteries are inflamed and they become clogged, they become stenotic or even ruptured, which leads to a myocardial infarction or a stroke. We have aneurysm formation, which is the dilation of a vessel wall, leading to rupture or dissection, which is very fatal, often diagnosed too late. We do have peripheral artery disease, where it is inflammation, atherosclerosis in the lower extremities, where it leads to poor perfusion of our legs. And then we have aortic disease, where it is linked to aortic valve calcification and stenosis. And if your valves are not working correctly, it has a feedback on the vessels, but also a feedback on the heart, because the heart has to pump harder and becomes hypertrophic. So cardiovascular disease is really widespread through our body and the vessels are really important because they connect all the vital organs with each other. Now, how do we measure atherosclerosis or cardiovascular burden? In the clinic, this is a very simple way to measure it. And actually, it is done all over the world. We do this by measuring with multi-slide computed tomography, so CT scanning. And actually, this Time magazine uh, newspaper from 2005 reported how to stop a heart attack. 
And it is all about, do you know your calcium score? Calcium is important for cardiovascular disease. And what it is, is actually these white spots that are visualized on a CT in the heart. You see the uh, um, yellow arrow, which indicates calcification of the aorta. You see the red arrow, which indicates calcification of the coronary arteries. And then you see the white arrow, which is calcification of the aortic valve. And actually, in all patients, when you have a higher vascular calcium score, you have a greater risk on a heart attack. So it's really important that we know our calcium score because this is directly linked to the inflammatory process linked to cardiovascular disease. And actually, if we consider ourselves, our human bodies, we are a super saturated bag, or, um, bag of, of calcium and phosphate salts. And calcium and phosphate, maybe you still remember from chemistry lessons, if they see each other, they form this insoluble product. And that is a calcium crystal. And our calcium and phosphate concentration exceeds the solubility product by, an, by a, a magnitude of, of, of several levels. And so we have inhibitors that inhibit this process of calcium phosphate nucleation in our body. And actually it was already reported that we are a calcium phosphate pillar in the Bible when Lot's wife looked back to Sodom and Gomorrah and turned into a pillar of calcium phosphate salts. Now, if we screen the literature, and this was done by a former PhD student of mine, and he screened the whole literature, and if calcification is present at any vascular site, be it in the coronary, carotids, uh, aorta, or peripheral arteries, it doesn't matter. If calcification is present, then the risk on a cardiovascular event increases by some three and a half fold. So calcification is really linked to cardiovascular morbidity. Even worse in cardiovascular mortality, if calcification is present at any vascular site, then the risk of dying from a cardiovascular event increases by some fourfold. But also the other way is, uh, around is true. If there is absence of calcification in the vasculature, the survival in 10 years is approximately only 1%. So calcification really predicts if you are event-free or will develop a cardiovascular event. Now, how can we precisely see calcification? Because the resolution of a CT is 200 micrometers, which is absolutely nothing what we term microcalcification. So are we really reporting everything that is probably not seen? So nowadays we have these radioactive tracers, so for example sodium fluor 18, which detects the active microcalcification. Now this microcalcification, for me as a basic scientist, as a biochemist, are typically between half a micrometer and 15 micrometers. And these are too small to pick up by, micro, by uh, CT analysis in the body. This also means, and this was stated in this paper, that these active microcalcifications are present at sites that are not visible for calcification with CT in 86% of the patients. So in 86% of the patients which we classify as no calcification present, these sodium hotspots were present. So these microcalcifications are for sure associated with inflammation and with a vulnerable black phenotype. So the question that we raised is, is microcalcification preceding inflammation? And this is how it is envisioned. If you have this rubber tire with this small crystalline stone on it, it will damage the rubber because this is a soft material and this hard stone will damage the tire leading to friction, small ruptures to a final rupture. Now, how does inflammation and calcification relate like? So we have this inflammation process, which is in the vessel wall present, and then feeds back and leads to calcification. And then the calcification amplifies this loop, and then you have more inflammation. We can also think away the other way around, that calcification is present, microcalcifications, that this feeds the inflammatory process, 
And that inflammation further drives and propels the process of calcification. Because in the end, that is what we measure to detect atherosclerotic burden. And this was depicted also by uh, Mark Dreck from the University in Edinburgh, that we can measure inflammation, but we also can measure um, microcalcification using these radioactive tracers. And these both predict plaque rupture and myocardial infarction. So what to measure? Is it inflammation or is it calcification? So in this study measuring aortic valve stenosis, which is a cardiovascular disease, they measured sodium fluor uh, FDG, deoxyglucose. And this is a marker for inflammation. You see here controlled patients, but also patients with mild, moderate, and severe aortic stenosis. There was not that much of an uptake in terms of inflammation. However, if they measured in the same patient population calcification using sodium fluor 18, detecting this active microcalcification, there was a strong and significant increase with disease uh, severity. So in this study, it seems that calcification is a way better predictor of the disease than inflammation is. And now I talk about local inflammation and local calcification. And if you look at this picture, this is a picture of sodium fluor 18. This detects the microcalcification in an atherosclerotic lesion. One can think of, okay, the fire inside. Is it inflammation or is it, as this picture depicts, calcification? Calcification can happen in the vessels at two different sites. We have the atherosclerosis, which is linked to inflammation and lipid infiltration. We do know that calcification is linked to atherosclerotic burden. That is why we measure it in uh, the clinic. It is linked to these lipid lakes, these atherosclerotic plaques, and it is linked to vulnerable plaques and stenosis of a vessel wall, leading to myocardial infarction or stroke. The, uh, the uh, symptoms are often acute, and the therapy is not much. We can give statins to, lip, uh, to lower the lipids. We can give aspirin to prevent uh, clotting. And we can do stenting. But calcification can also happen in the medial layer. And here it is associated with the aging population and with comorbidities such as renal disease or uh, diabetes. We see calcification in the vascular media as a kind of um, a rail uh, rank, rank. And what you can see it is stiffening the vessel wall. So our vessels become stiffened. It leads to that the heart has to pump harder and you get cardiac overload and we get poor organ perfusion. Treatment, again, there is not much we can do. There is blood pressure medication or we can give bisphosphonates, which are now only in experimental uh, setting in animals. And I have to state that medial calcification occurs in the absence of lipid infiltration and um, uh, inflammation. So I do like to read literature because I'm a scientist and I also like to go back in time because in the old days there was a lot of very, very good um, research. And this is an American study from 1944 in which they isolated from autopsies aortas and analyzed calcification in the media and in the intima. Now what you can clearly see from this picture is that medial calcification at all ages precedes atherosclerosis and that at the age of 50 some 90 percent of us have medial calcification and that atherosclerosis only appears at those sites where medial degradation or calcification was present so it is really important to limit inflammation that we also limit calcification. So for that we went in a collaboration with our academic hospital, with the Department of Pathology, and we obtained specimens, coronary specimens from patients with a type 1 to 4 lesion, atherosclerotic lesion, a type 5 lesion, and a type 5B lesion. And normally only the type 5B lesion is reported to be calcified, and we wanted to know is there calcification present in a type 1 to 4 lesion? So these were the interesting patients for us. And so we collaborated with the Technical University in Eindhoven, who have a micro 
microprobe proton uh, detector. And with this technology, you can analyze calcium phosphate elements in a very, very low resolution. So what we found is that calcification, microcalcification, is already present in the more or less healthy vessel wall, which increases in a type 2, 3, and 4 lesion. So even if we detect no calcification on a CT scan, by looking closer, calcification is already there. So the process of calcification is already happening. And we tried to correlate that with inflammation, with, with many, many other markers, and there was only one marker that really correlated with the microcalcification, which is this UCMGP, uncarboxylated matrix lab protein. And this protein is known as the strongest inhibitor of vascular calcification. And also, very importantly, this protein is a vitamin K-dependent protein. So what is MGP? It was discovered um, end of the, uh, of the 90s, last century, and people believed it's another protein that is involved in bone mineralization. And then they created this MGP knockout mouth. So they took the gene, took out this gene that encodes for this protein, put back all the DNA, and these are mice that are born without making this protein. It's a vitamin K-dependent protein. It's relatively small, 84 amino acids, so it's more a peptide than a protein. It has GLA residues for its activity, so it needs to undergo these post-transnational modifications with the aid of vitamin K. And this protein is produced by vascular smooth muscle cells. Now, if we knock out this protein in mice, all mice die within eight weeks after birth. And if you see here the MGP minus minus mouse, this is the mouse that lacks this protein. Everything in black, what you see, is calcification of the vessel wall. And in the upper picture, in the red, you see that next to the spine, there is a second spine. This is not a spine, this is the aorta, which is completely calcified. And all mice died due to rupture of this vascularized and calcified vessel. Now, we also have a human equivalent of the MGP knockout, which is called coital syndrome. There is only 40-odd cases known in the whole world. And so it's a very rare disease. And it is very rare because this is not going hand in hand with life. So this absence of this protein in humans is really detrimental. So what is the role of vascular smooth muscle cells? Because they produce this MGP. Now these vascular smooth muscle cells, they normally support vascular tone in our vessel wall. And this is very important to pump the blood to all our organs. However, these vascular smooth muscle cells, they are very plastic cells. They are more or less cells that resemble a kind of stem cell niche. So they can become a inflammatory smooth muscle cell a calcific vascular smooth muscle cell, or a matrix producing smooth muscle cell. And actually, they can go all the directions in the vessel wall. So this vascular smooth muscle cell is really important to have that in the right conformation and that the vascular smooth muscle cell stays contractile. So what we did is we wanted to know if a vascular smooth muscle cell, if it calcifies, can attract macrophages, inflammatory cells, because the current concept and the textbook concept is that we have inflammation, endothelial cells become activated, there's monocytes adhering, and then infiltrating in the vessel wall. So now we want to think the other way around. If there is an insult in the vessel wall, for example, a microcalcification, would that attract macrophages? So what we did is we calcified muscle cells or we did not calcify smooth muscle cells. And we used the medium in the lower chamber of this Boyden chamber. And in the upper layer we used macrophages. And we measured the migration of these macrophages to either the non-calcified medium or the calcified medium. And what you can see is that if there is calcified medium, so signals secreted by calcifying smooth muscle cells, there are more macrophages migrating to that side. 
Meaning that if we have this insult in the vessel wall, it will attract inflammation. Now, this is a kind of in-between conclusion slide. So we have vascular smooth muscle cells which support vascular tone. However, as we age, we degrade elastin and collagen is replaced. So our vessels stiffen. We also end up with more calcification due to the phenotypic switching of these vascular smooth muscle cells. This whole process is accelerated if there are pro-inflammatory macrophages, which impair smooth muscle cell function, but also create oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is something that we heard about a lot. If the vessel stiffens, this feeds back on the clinical situation. We get arterial stiffening, we get aberrant hemodynamics, which then leads to cardiovascular disease. Now, if we have that, stiffened vessels, it will further support shear stress and mechanical stress, which also leads to endothelial dysfunction and giving more phenotypic switching. Then we have comorbidities, such as di diabetes, which produce ages, these advanced glycation end products, which impair smooth muscle cells and also degrade elastin. We have chronic kidney disease, which support the uremic toxin environment, and that leads to more oxidative stress and more calcification. This is all known in literature. And then we have, fortunately, this protein, MGP, matrix lab protein, with the aid of vitamin K, can prevent mineralization and vascular remodeling. However, comorbidities will also impair the carboxylation of this protein leading to more calcification. And finally, we can have a rescue. We can give vitamin K supplementation to further support and fuel this system that prevents and inhibits mineralization of the vasculature. Now, my passion for vitamin K started when I did my PhD, and this is the cover of my PhD thesis, where I studied the role of vitamin K1 and K2 in bone and cardiovascular disease. And actually, it was that I met my, one of my um, um, colleagues, uh, Dr. Martin Shearer from, from King's College uh, in, in London. And he was a great supervisor to me. Um, he is retired now, and he was one of the founding fathers of vitamin K research. And together, we published this paper in which he stated that a vitamin, once regarded as a Cinderella of um, soy, fat-soluble vitamins, emerged from a single function, hemostasis, vitamin to a multifunction vitamin and arguably the most fascinating of all. Because most of you know vitamin K from the hemostatic coagulation system. Because what we do is all babies that are born, the first thing they receive within an hour is a shot of vitamin K. All babies worldwide. So if it is good for, for babies, why would it not be good for us to prevent mineralization? And I would term these GLA proteins as glamorous proteins. So vascular calcification, what to do about it? Actually, it relates to aging. We are as old as our arteries are. This was postulated by Thomas Sydenham in England in 1668. I have to make a slight change to this statement because today, 2023, it's a man or a woman is as old as his or her arteries. So what we want to do is prevent calcification of vessels and prevent calcification of heart valves. This is linked to comorbidities, to aging, and we are e urgently looking for the bleach. How can we prevent or reduce vascular calcification? And I came up with the idea, it might be vitamin K. So what is this Cinderella of fat-soluble vitamins? It's it di discovered in 1929 by the Danish researcher Hendrik Dam, and he was feeding chickens a fat-free diet. And he noticed that all these chickens were bleeding to death. And he isolated one micronutrient, which was vitamin K. K stands for coagulation because it was published in a German journal, and coagulation is written with a K in German language. And so it became known that this vitamin supports blood clotting. 
We know now in 2023 that there are 14 vitamin K-dependent proteins are known, also known and termed as GLA proteins, among them matrix GLA protein. And vitamin K is a cofactor, and it's the only cofactor for this en enzyme in activating these vitamin K-dependent proteins. And we have two flavors. We have vitamin K1 and we have vitamin K2. Now, vitamin K1 is produced by green leafy vegetables, and it's there bound to the chloroplast membrane. And it supports energy production of plants. Vitamin K2, menaquinones, are of bacterial origin. So we find it in fermented foods, like fermented cheese or fermented soybeans, such as natto, which is a very popular dish in Japan. And bacteria produce vitamin K2 for antioxidant properties, but also to generate ATP. And we think that vitamin K has some superpower. Now, to see the difference between K1 and K2 and which of the two is better, during my PhD thesis, 12 volunteers, among myself, consumed a meal containing 100 gram of natto and 400 gram of spinach, both containing one milligram of K1 and one milligram of MK7. And if you look at the absorption profile, then you can see that MK7 is some tenfold better absorbed than K1 from green leafy vegetables such as spinach. And this is meaning that most of the K1 from your diet is ending up in the toilet, whereas MK7 is more or less completely absorbed. A second notice from this graph is the long half-life of MK7, meaning that it stays around for two to three days to fulfill its action as a cofactor and to support carboxylation, listen, activation of vitamin K-dependent proteins. Now, with this, many population studies were carried out, and here are three of them that I list. The higher K2 intake is associated with a risk reduction of coronary artery disease by 40% between high K2 intake and low K2 intake. No effect of K1. A high K2 intake is associated with reduced coronary artery calcification in women. 20% less calcification of coronary arteries in women taking high MK7, MK8, MK9 via the diet. Third study in 16,000 postmenopausal women, a high MK7, MK8, MK9 intake reduces the incidence of coronary artery disease, a 9% reduction by every 10 micrograms of K2 intake. So this suggests that vitamin K2 is really important in reducing cardiovascular disease. But it is very difficult to measure vitamin K because vitamin K in our plasma really fluctuates a lot and is dependent on the meal we had the day before. So what we do is we measure surrogate markers, surrogate markers such as this MGP. If there is sufficient vitamin K, in the circulation, we can measure carboxylated MGP. In a state of vitamin K deficiency, we can see that uncarboxylated MGP is produced, and we also can measure uncarboxylated MGP in the circulation, which is a surrogate marker for a vascular vitamin K deficiency. So this is what we did. We measured this surrogate marker in patients with aortic stenosis. And this is a collaborative study with the Rikshospital in Oslo in Norway. And what you can see is that patients with a good vitamin K status, so a low and inactive MGP, had a very good survival. But that those patients with a high inactive MGP and therefore a poor vascular vitamin K status had a very poor survival. Actually, they had a five-fold more increased risk of dying. If we included vitamin K antagonists to reduce hypercoagulability, so which is given to rescue the patient, actually it went up to ninefold increase. So vitamin K deficiency is really leading to mortality, to more calcification, more inflammation. And so here is the first study, and it's going more than 15 years ago, back in time, that we tried 
to convince people that vitamin K can rescue calcification. So what we did is we fed rats, it's an animal model, with warfarin, a vitamin K antagonist, to induce vascular calcification. Now, if you induce or feed rats with a controlled diet, nothing happens. Rodents do normally do not calcify. If you give them the vitamin K antagonist inducing a vitamin K deficiency, calcification after six weeks and 12 weeks increases significantly. If we switch after six weeks of warfarin to low vitamin K, calcification progresses. So the presence of calcification is the best predictor for progression. So if calcification is present, it will progress. However, if we gave the animals a high vitamin K diet, we could completely block the progression of calcification. So this was the first study that if you support vitamin K status, then you can activate MGP, thereby inhibiting further progression of calcification. A second study, only two years ago, now this time with intimal calcification. These were ApoE mice, which are prone to develop atherosclerosis, same as in humans. So if we give them a controlled diet, not much happens, so the atherosclerotic plaque is not really calcified. However, if we give them first a 12 weeks Western type diet, meaning hamburger-like diet, and then switch to the chow diet, calcification is present. If we continue the Western type diet, we even see more calcification in the atherosclerotic plaque. However, if we had first 12 weeks of Western type diet and then change to MK7, vitamin K2, calcification was reduced in the atherosclerotic plaque, meaning that we can hold the progression of calcification simply by giving this nutrient, by activating vitamin K-dependent proteins such as MGP. Keeping it inactivated using warfarin even further increases calcification, supporting the hypothesis that vitamin K status in the plaque is really important to either inhibit calcification or to drive calcification. But these are rodents, and you want, of course, to see the human data. So together with the um, university in Aachen, Germany, we did this study. Patients with aortic valve calcification was, were treated with vitamin K for one year. And here we have a study and, and the, the result that vitamin K treatment can reduce the inactive form of MGP. So this, the treatment worked. And then we measured the volume of calcification in the aortic valve. A one-year treatment, placebo versus vitamin K, reduced calcification progression by 50%. So this was the first sign that also in humans, giving vitamin K can reduce vascular and vulvular calcification. There is another study on its way, and we are at this moment analyzing the data. The next study, in CKD5D patients, these dialysis patients have a lot of uremic toxins, and they suffer from vascular calcification. These patients do not die from kidney disease they die from vascular calcification and cardiovascular disease. 60 hemodialysis patients, standard care or standard care plus extra vitamin K. We could show that if you give extra vitamin K, then you can reduce the inactive levels of MGP by 70%. We could also see that we could reduce progression of coronary artery calcification by 70% but due to the small numbers was borderline not significant. And also the progression of thoracic aortic calcification was reduced by 60% in one and a half year, and this was significant, even despite the low number of patients included in this trial. So this is really something that we should take. Vitamin K is safe. There is no upper tolerance level. It has no harm for anybody. So why not give it to our patients? Final study, vitamin K2 supplementation in coronary artery disease by a Danish research group. And they showed that those patients with the CAC score, so with the coronary artery calcification score above 400, 
had after one and a half year, a sig after two years, sorry, a reduction, a significant reduction in the progression of calcification, simply by giving a nutrient by this nutraceutical MK7. Now, this was all the canonical function, and the last three slides will also contain some non-canonical functions of vitamin K. So vitamin K needs to be um, a cofactor for the carboxylation of vitamin K-dependent proteins. And if it is present, it activates MGP and it inhibits calcification. And vitamin K is recycled, and this recycling loop is supported by the enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase. And this vitamin K epoxide reductase also can scavenge free radicals. This is known. And it can thereby be an antioxidant. And this is also why plants and bacteria, because they don't contain vitamin K-dependent proteins, probably use this vitamin K cycle. And very recently last year, there was this paper in Nature that vitamin K is the most ancient system preventing ferroptosis, lipid peroxidation. And vitamin K is able to prevent this lipid peroxidation. So we also tested this, and so vitamin K came out as a very, very potent antioxidant. We know that vitamin K can activate vitamin K-dependent proteins. If you add warfarin to these cells, calcification is supported. If you add warfarin and vitamin K2, you prevent the uh, mineralization. We also wanted to show that vitamin K is an antioxidant. So if you see this slide, we treated vascular smooth muscle cells with warfarin. And what you can see is that there is an increase in oxidative stress, which could be completely rescued by giving warfarin together with MK7. So MK7 could completely block oxidative stress in smooth muscle cells. And further, we know that ubiquinone 10 supports energy production, ATP production. That is what is known. MK7 is also going to mitochondria and supporting ATP production in the same manner as ubiquinone 10. Final slide, smoking also increases cardiovascular disease by causing, and you can see this from this micro-CT scanning, microcalcification. Nicotine giving to smooth muscle cells increases reactive oxygen species, which could completely be blocked by giving MK7. Nicotine increases extracellular vesicle release, which is the nidus for mineralization, could be completely blocked by vitamin K2, MK7. And finally, nicotine-induced calcification, which could completely be blocked by vitamin K2. So also there, MK7 is really a potent antioxidant. So how do I see it? Aging drives oxidative stress, DNA damage, leads to senescence, accelerated aging, and we get this senescence-associated secretory phenotype. It leads to smooth muscle cell calcification and inflammation, leading to EVA, early vascular aging. Vitamin K can reduce calcification of these smooth muscle cells, but then we also have this NRF2 transcription factor, which leads to the inhibition of oxidative stress. Vitamin K2 also fuels this process, being an antioxidant. And finally, vitamin K2 also induces anti-ferroptosis pathways and is an antioxidant by supporting this V-core recycling, thereby scavenging free radicals. So if you think research is expensive, try disease. I say goodbye from this very beautiful ancient city, Maastricht, where I uh, work. And in the Netherlands, we also, and in Europe, we're working on the concept of blue planet, where we'd want to translate blue zones, where people get very old, into a blue planet where everybody has the right to live old in a happy and healthy manner. And these are my acknowledgments.